things. Seder preparation extravaganza, I think is what it needs to be called. Um, we have the wonderful Rabbi Deborah Blaston with us, who is honestly over the years the most creative person when it comes to Seder that I've ever met. And we are really, really excited, or well, I am really excited because you don't know what's to come, to spend this evening with her, just learning some new ways, especially you now it's been a full year now um, to have our second Seder online. So I'm not going to hold you up. I'm just going to say thank you very much for joining us. Um, you're going to be muted during it, but I'm sure with Deborah there'll be plenty of times to um, ask questions and engage and make sure you get everything out of this that you need to do. Um, we are recording this. It's not live on anything. We're just recording it essentially just to use as an educational resource for people who couldn't use it, you know, who couldn't be with us this evening or to send to, you know, individual participants, and, you know, people in the future, but not to be put on, um, um, on online or anything like that. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Arita. Hi, everyone. Um, so firstly, it's really um, lovely that you're here. One of the reasons, just so you know, that we're not live on anywhere is that um, we wanted to create a space where at different points people can ask questions and share their ideas um, and ideas in formation. And sometimes it's easier to share ideas in formation when uh, you don't have an unknown audience. So um, let me just say a little bit about um, how this session came about. And I'm going to ask you um, to multitask as I'm talking, um, because I think it's important that um, you get what you need out of this space. So um, if you could use the chat and I'd love to know a little bit about your plans for Passover this year. Um, what brings you here? What are you working towards? Are you leading a Seder? Are you going to a Seder? Have you got absolutely no idea and you're hoping that the rules are suddenly going to change? Um, where are you at um, and what, what, uh, what hat are you wearing when you're in in this place um to take um just take a moment um and as you're doing that i'll just say um something about i think probably why i'm here um which is that um passover and especially um the haggadah is a really important part of my judaism i didn't grow up with seder night um i grew up in a, a home where um my family loved their Jewishness, but didn't feel empowered to do Judaism in the home at all. And in my teens, I realized that if I didn't learn how to lead a Seder, um, my family would never have those memories. And um, for me, creating my family's Haggadah has become a real labor of love. And um, every year we, um, we have an entirely new uh, Haggadah. Now I'm not saying that as an expectation that anyone would do that, but rather as a, a an opener to say that something I've learned in the past uh, 17 uh, seders that we've done in this way is that um, there's something very special about Passover across the Jewish world, which is that if you're Orthodox or you're Reform, it's the one place where innovation and creativity that starts with the needs of the people in the room has a priority. And we have Haggadot from every era of history that include political jokes about the moment in time that include private family notes about the people around the table and what I want us to be able to get out of this evening is a sense of how do you create and um, help or help a relative to build a Seder that feels as personable participatory enjoyable as possible and that you feel empowered and not disempowered by the fact that we are online so there's a real kind of mix of people who are here. Um, some people thinking about communal seders, and I'll talk a little bit about something that uh, we've been working on today, hopefully that will help you with communal seders. Um, child friendly and short mixed faith families, we should definitely be thinking about um, the various experiences around our tables, um, hybrid, some people on Zoom, some people in the room, we'll think a little bit about that. But we've got a lot of people who are leading seders for a couple of households on Zoom, but I can see some that have got um, 11 households. Um, Jenny, uh, you're incredible in so many ways, but 11 households, that is quite a Seder. Um, different generations, faiths and interest levels, baby friendly. Um, 
So there's some real mixed needs in this room. And what I'll try and do as we go through is think a little bit about how um, I might send resources and tips your way for your for your family Seder. Um, but here's actually where I want to start because Seder online gives us an extra frame for thinking about Passover. Now I know not all of you are going to be doing Seder online. I know some of you might be doing a small Seder at home, but I think that this um, question is still there, which is this idea of how does Passover this year hold feelings of loss and where might we experience it as a moment of liberation? Why do I say that? Because there is some real loss that accompanies Passover this year. Um, maybe very, very real tangible uh, loss in the form of bereavement for lots of families, but also the sense of um, lost memories, lost moments, lost time and lost company. And coming round to a second Passover in a pandemic, I think it's okay and maybe important to acknowledge that, that it does have a certain amount of emotion attached to it. Alongside that is this question of liberation. Nobody is cooking for a gajillion people this year. Um, there is just a difference in how it's coming about. We um, potentially have the freedom to be honest about things that have never worked for our families and to take all the learning of the last year and say, how can this be a really freeing experience? How can we reflect on our own experiences as a past year of pandemic and how they help us understand the notion of, of freedom in a totally different way? So I, I love this image of kind of this um, paralysis of choice in this cartoon of uh, the exodus, the original exodus, the matzah on our backs was really all about just kind of getting out um, and uh, being stripped back. And um, the image of our contemporary Passover being one of a paralysis of choice, the multitude of products available um, and even when it comes to virtual Passover the huge number of resources out there and so the first place I actually want us to start is to strip back all of that and to not think about the festival not think about the books the Haggadah the setup but actually to stop and think what does it mean to say just simply to yourselves why are we doing this like why are we having this Seder and why are we having it in this way? Why is that important? Because the decisions that we make should answer that why. If the why is it's an amazing opportunity to get your family together all around the world, and you never get to have a conversation over the Seder table, it's a missed opportunity. So the why is really important. And I, if you're planning a Seder, it's really okay to ask the why. And then when you've got the why, it's worth thinking about what are the traditions that are important to your family or your group of people. Not everybody marks Seder with a family. Yes, I will share the slides at the end. I'll make sure Sarita has them to send out. You'll see they've got some um, Passover toys inside them. So uh, you, you're, uh, you'll have permission to reuse them in whatever way you want because uh, we've, already, um, yeah, we've already talked about that. So yes, what are the traditions that really matter? And the other bit, what do you hate? What is the point where people get their phone out normally? When somebody falls asleep, where do the arguments happen? Let's be honest. Like what does not work or has not worked in the past? And that includes what was terrible about last year's Seder? Like, was it a disaster giving everybody the ability to unmute? Or was it hilarious? Think about it. What doesn't work? And then this question of what are the different meanings that Passover has this year? And finally, how are you gonna capture the moment? Are there things that you actually in future want to be able to, you know, when I opened my Haggadah this year, loads of pieces of paper fell out, including um, this one. Which I don't know if you can see it because I'm now really tiny, but it's the four children in Star Wars. Um, and it has like a wine stain on it. And I, I don't know what other stains are on it, but I think maybe it's better not to think about it. Um, but it has, a, it has the kind of the, the texture of Passover of old. So how are you going to fold this Passover back in in the future? What might you want to record or hold on to? So those would be some questions that I think if you're going to start moving towards planning a Seder this year, or even you're talking to a family member and you have this vision in your head of how disastrous Seder is going to be and you're here because you're looking for ways to salvage it, 
then having these conversations with them. How are we going to make sure that this child is heard during managed tenure? What are we going to do about the fact this elderly relative doesn't really understand what's going on? Think about the whys. Um, it will really help. It will really help. Um, and then we're going to think about how do we make it really special anyway? I wanted to show you one of my favorite people who is thinking about this and her name is Rebecca Lowen. Um, and she's a, a writer about Jewish ritual um, and a food blogger. And um, she's done some really amazing stuff around um, how do you make the most of Passover in, in uh, isolation. And something that she's really thinking about that I think is really worthwhile, either if you're doing a small Seder at home and it feels like it might be a bit awkward and you don't have anyone on Zoom, or Dovka, because everybody else is on Zoom and you're on your own at home or in a pair or a small group at home and it feels lonely, is to really think about how you up the ante. And so she has uh, ideas for Mutz's s'mores boards and little Seder discussion cards, things you can put in the post to people, invitations, and really creative small little recipes. She has these gorgeous like little Mutza um, place cards that you can dip a uh, half a cracker in chocolate and then write someone's name on it to mark out their place. But if you're making Seder in a place you live, you eat, you argue, you work, it's the same table, then thinking about how you make that table feel different for a night is going to be really important. And again, her link to her website will be um, shared afterwards, but I think she's particularly excellent in thinking this through. Her name is Rebecca Lowen. And um, you'll have a link to her resources at the end. Um, I felt a bit sad when I saw this slide because um, it reminded me of kind of last year, how we said next year in person. And um, I wondered um, a little bit about this idea that in every generation, each person should see themselves as they personally left Egypt of um, how many years did our ancestors in Egypt kind of think, well, maybe this will be the year. And that it's okay that we're uh, in this liminal state of being able to remember what freedom is like and not quite living it yet. That's maybe part of it and it's okay. Um, and if you're looking back on last year's resources and seeing these kind of things, it's okay that they feel a bit sad and maybe next year it'll be true. Um, you do need a Haggadah. Now, here are two options, but I'm gonna show you a third as well, which I think might work a little bit better for some people. So last year, Liberal Judaism, our sister movement, produced an emergency Haggadah for use during lockdown. It's very short and it's very good. Um, our reform Haggadah is ex exceptional. It's beautiful. It's available online in flip book form. Um, it's available for purchase um, from the movement. And it's really, really lovely. It's accessible. It's traditional, but with extra nice bits. And if you're clergy or you're thinking about a communal seder you're going to get an email um from um, either me or rabbi paul friedman about the fact that we're going to make it available as a uh, slides for communal seder so um if uh, if that would be useful for you that enables you to do something that's a bit more uh, immersive than a, a flipping book um or and this is uh, just a moment of uh, if you have someone in your family who is arty this is my passover project make your own so I'm really glad no one who I'm related to is here because um, the one on the far right is this year's Haggadah in progress. But something that I do each year is I make a new Haggadah cover. And uh, something that we've come to learn over time as a family is that when Seder feels special with a group of people, it's often because you think about what every person around the table can bring. So it may be that you're looking at these and you're thinking of your uh, cousin, your friend, your nephew, whoever's coming to your Seder and you're thinking, well, they're quite funny. Um, task them with making some fun things, some, some pictures to, to put throughout. Um, it doesn't need to be a cover. We've fallen into a bit of a format, but uh, I think the most uh, satisfying way to create a Seder is to do it for yourself. And you don't have to make it up. Um, I can see some nods around the room. This is a, a phenomenal resource. It's called Hugger.com. And it's a giant collection of what they call clips short resources for each part of the Seder. It's organized in order and they have templates like an interfaith Seder or a feminist Seder or a cartoon Seder. 
And you can start with that and you can edit it. But if you're thinking, well, you know, I don't really want the long, the long Hagada quiet, you know, I want something like kind of short, but um, funny. And I just, I really hate that song. And like, if we just never had to flick through it, it would be fine. This is your place to go. Um, I know some people um, who are here are users of it. And maybe when we go to questions, some of you will share a little bit about how you've used it. One of the real advantages is it allows you to create Haggadah online, copy the link and send it to your guests at your Seder who can either view it online or print their own PDF version. So um, it doesn't involve you having to print out anything, post anything. You can deal with the whole thing by email. But there are loads of things on here. Um, and I would say, especially if you have children at your Seder or people who've not been to Passover before or people who think they've seen every single bit of the Haggadah and know everything that there is to know about Passover, um, wherever they are on that spectrum, you'll find something on here. And I would say you don't need to create a whole new Haggadah. You might have a Haggadah you've used forever and you just want a reading to use before hand washing or a different idea for the four children. And you can find it all on here. Um, again, you'll get this link in the chat, so you don't need to, um, in, the, in the notes, so you don't need to um, worry at all about um, making a note of it now. Um, and I want to think about how to make it work a little bit. Um, and I want to say before I do this, there is an assumption here that this is a, a Seder that kind of lives online. As I'm going through these tips, if there are things that you did last year with your Seder that you thought worked really nicely or that you're doing this year, um, will you make a, um, make a note of them in the chat so we can talk through them and I might come to you and ask you to say them out loud. So I could already see that Jenny talked about sending out goodie bags um, to her family, which I think is something we've learned a lot about this year with Bara and Bat Mitzvah services, how special it can be when you post things out to people but you might decide to put together a, a I don't know a little gift bag with the afikoman in it and some other things and send it out by post to your guests maybe send them a mysterious envelope that they mustn't open until a part of the seder we've got quite good this year uh, in lockdown especially at uh, zoom quizzes murder mysteries all sorts of uh, wild and fun games and uh Maybe you have someone in your family who has been the, um, or in your group of friends, who's been the, the fun, the fun organizer this year. Um, you might want to reach out to them and say, do you want to cause some chaos for Passover? Would you like to email people a secret identity that they have to um, have throughout dinner? Um, someone else around the table they need to pretend to be and everybody has to guess at the end or if you feel like not having a family argument, maybe you'd give everybody a celebrity instead. Um, or words that people have to use um, during the Seder meal and uh, use them regularly and everybody else has to guess what other secret word is. So you can task people with creating a bit of fun. The other thing you need to do is assign a host. Um, somebody who um, can kind of compare the night Again, this is something that if you're hosting Seder and you're organizing the Haggadah, you don't need to be the host. Um, it might be that actually you have someone uh, in your people who are coming to your Seder who for their job does a load of hosting internet meetings. Great, involve them, let them be the host. Give them a list of who's coming, let them decide who's doing whatever, give them a role. Um, it's a particularly good role, by the way, for uh, kind of like slightly disaffected teens because uh, being the host and being able to um, make sure people are muted or unmuted at the right times will keep them concentrating. And um, also it's quite fun to be able to mute your parents. So um, it might be that you have someone around your Seder table who uh, may enjoy that little taste of Pharaoh's power trip and uh, maybe that's okay. Um, you also don't have the luxury of being able to look around a table and see who's sitting next to each other. Um, so you can make a virtual seating chart. So you can just have a list and post it in the chat of everyone who's there. So everyone knows who's next to each other, which means that you always know who's next to read. There are fancy ways of doing it on Zoom where you can release the host's video order. I'm not convinced it works. I think it's just easier to have a list. You can just do it in alphabetical order. 
um, or you can embrace chaos, but make sure people know the rules of engagement. Seder is a bit different to hanging out with your friends on Zoom or being in a work meeting, it has lots of moving parts. And so it's okay to kind of impose, pardon the pun, some order on the Seder. And it's okay, it kind of needs it. Like the whole thing is set up um, to kind of structure the chaos of lots of Jews um, kind of sticking their fingers in bits of food. Um, um, oh, was that a question? That, 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 yeah, can we ask, yeah, is it okay to ask questions now? Do you want yeah, to wait? of course. Okay, so the seating chart. Um, so one of my seders is a communal seder. Mm -hmm. And I may not know in advance who is going to be there, but mm -hmm. I do want everyone to, to read. You know, I do want to be participative. So, so, um, so how would you do that seating chart then? Just, uh, I mean, can we just re do, rely on the participants list? Can everyone see the participants list? Everyone can see the participants list. So in Zoom, if you click on the, uh, at the bottom of Zoom, there are a number of little options that kind of show up at the bottom of your window. And one of them is participants. And that list is in alphabetical order. So you can, and the advantage of that is if you arrive late, you arrive in order. Um, so one way you can do it, that's a really good way, is to do it in alphabetical order using the participants list. Naomi, if you have a warden or someone who um, you think them having a role would be really good for them, they can also be in charge um, because not everybody's going to want to speak. So you could, mm -hmm. um, you can invite people, you could say at the beginning, if you, are up for reading please make sure that you put a little star before your zoom name that way you're never going to call on somebody who doesn't want to speak which is quite a nice way of not kind of putting people on the spot and um, not everyone wants to read um, and if you feel like your people are zoom accomplished enough you could put a, a star for uh, hebrew and a dash for english um, and then you literally just go down the list. Um, so it's kind, you know, you'll know your community and your cohort better than anyone else. But um, it might be that you want to have a warden who messages people privately, says, when you read on page three and they have like a list of mitzvot that they private message, or you go alphabetically, you'll decide based on what your community normally does. It's also okay to set the first thing up in advance. So email a few people and give them a role. Mm -hmm. And um then so that at the beginning you aren't kind of rushing to assign things and then have kind of first come first served afterwards so you'll decide what's right for your for your group of people I know for our communal seda at uh, FRS we are going to invite people to participate in very particular parts where everyone can be involved but um we're not going to kind of have people jumping in unplanned because it might not work because of the numbers I'm really aware that I don't want to give anyone any spoilers who are coming to our communal seder, but at the same time want to be useful. So I'm sorry if that's a little bit vague. Um, I'm just going to go through the rest of the, this list and then I can see some amazing um, ideas in the chat. So uh, inviting friends or relatives in different cities, I, I think it's probably a given at this point that that's worth doing. Um, test your technology, especially if you're using your device in a place you don't normally use it. Like a lot of us don't sit and eat at the same place as we sit at our computers. So it is worth just checking that your internet and stuff work in the place where you're planning on sitting for SEDA. Um, if you're moving a computer or you normally sit in your office, um, it's worth just not being surprised. It would, it would feel rubbish if you were surprised by things not working in the way you wanted them to. Um, more wine um, or sugar or whatever kind of is going to be the right kind of balm in that moment, it's okay to kind of um, indulge a bit in whatever is your safe indulgence on Passover. Embrace the fun and invite people to get creative. And we're gonna look at some examples of that. So we've got some really lovely answers in the chat of people's different creative ideas. And then I'll, I'll show you some others and then we'll do questions. Um, Rachel Fiddler um, has suggested a Kahoot quiz. Um, Kahoot is a, uh, I think probably people, lots of people have encountered it. It's a, a quiz kind of game that you can set up in advance. It's great. I would say that anyone who's been in online school for the past year has used it loads. So I'm going to share some other ideas with you that aren't Kahoot um, that are similar in their participatoriness, but um, will look a bit different to what they've been using at school, hopefully. So that will give you some variety. Um, Karen, 20 questions for where in the world is the Afikoman? I love that. 
Um, Karen, do you want to just unmute? Is that like the 21 questions game where you kind of have to get uh, to the answer by asking yes and no? Yeah, we did it last year. I tasked my parents with sorting it for the grandchildren um, and they had a really good time like just deciding how to do it. And then the kids were all engaged in uh, figuring that out um, on a day. It was, yeah, it was just, it was a very simple version. We didn't use anything visual with it. Um, we just did it as, as verbal, but there's, um, I see somebody else is talking about pictures with it as well. So there's obviously a multitude of ways you can do it. That's, a, that's exactly what I did for the Afikomen. Go on, Scott. I basically, um, we had, um, uh, there are about a half a dozen of us, uh, different groups, uh, zoomed in for our little Seder on the first night. And I basically said, I'm going to hide the Afikomen somewhere in the world. Um, you, Play 20 questions, you have to guess where it is. And it was um, basically somewhere where I had been. And I showed a picture at the end. It was a very specific location. And I had to guess where it was. And I think I might do this again this year, if um, depending on where I'm going to be the first night. So brilliant. Thanks, Scott. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, Jenny is going to steal your idea. I'm going to share some other Afi Coben ideas with you as well. Um, uh, Jenny has also said she's going to prime someone to join the Zoom as Elijah. This is something that we did last year. I think lots of people have also done it. Um, it's quite fun to have an empty device being Elijah. Um, you can also then, um, when you open the door or whatever, you can kind of like boot Elijah out. You can have a bit of fun with it. Um, you can also um, see if you have a, a, a friend who would be really up for it, just joining the Zoom as an actual human. Um, called Elijah, if you've got someone in your life who maybe doesn't really want to come to Seder but is up for causing chaos for five minutes, you can invite them to put on a cape and join the Zoom as Elijah. Um, and uh, that might be quite fun for them. Um, we've got, uh, oh, where have we gone? We've got the set of pictures from Jackson's Row and I'll show you another way you can use pictures. Um, ben has said, you sit alongside one side of the table and face the screen so that everyone kind of can be seen and everyone can see. That's a lovely idea for setup. Um, you're going to hide the Afikomen in the grandparents' home and the kids have to direct the grandpa to take the iPad and search the direction. So it's like a, Judy, do you want to explain? It's like remote driving. Go for it. Um, someone has messaged me privately to say they'll ask the same friend, uh, who calls pretending to be Santa to be Elijah. Um, no problem, Judy. Um, so let's think about ways you can get creative. I'm going to show you some, um, some things that can help you and then some other examples. I'm showing you these with permission to fully lift them and adapt them. And um, also with some examples of places you can go. So if you're thinking about Passover music, Cantor Zoe Jacobs did a session last night on the sounds of the Seder, and that's available on the Reform Movement Facebook page. At FRS, we've also put together a couple of playlists of Passover music. So if you um, want to be able to listen to and learn kind of some Passover songs, um, or just have music playing on the background for ambiance, then uh, you can find both of these on Spotify. Um, thinking about the Afikomen a little bit, I'm going to come out of this screen share for a moment. I want to show you what I think is the best Afikomen hunt I've seen in a while. Um, so this is a site called Genially. And this person has created a full Afikomen escape room, including uh, like, uh, they're all like interactive quizzes. Um, oh, one second. So there's a, where is it? Um, a thing about the order of the Seder, which set goes next. It's a whole load of quizzes and each one reveals a code. And, um, Basically, at the end, you put a code in and it unlocks an escape room and you find the Afikomen. Um, I'll give you the link to this um, afterwards. But the, one of the reasons I wanted to show you this site is if any of you were thinking about using Kahoot, which lets you do quizzes, this lets you set up loads of different formats of stuff. And it's incredibly simple. So if you have a like 14, 15 year old, I'd say like 14 to 18 year old probably at home who, um, like find kind of would maybe feel more engaged with Seder if they had a role to play, then something like this, where they can basically build their own yeah. escape room um, 
can really help them feel here it's a plagues maze so this one you follow the plagues in order and if you do it you get a letter each time and then you put the letter in and you unlock the padlock now they could do all sorts of things with this and i wouldn't be too prescriptive with them but if you have someone in your home or in your family or in your seder gathering who thrives in responsibility and is a bit creative that's a really nice place to send them um someone started talking um do you want to talk great if you change your mind just stick your hand up maybe use the zoom raise your hand so that i can see um if you want to speak last year we found a load of other different escape room places um, i know ben langleben who's here tried out some of them um, and actually did something really creative with the afikoman last year um, I don't know if you want to share what you did or if, uh, if you'll use the chat instead, but I thought it was particularly brilliant. Um, yeah, I'm happy to. So I, I tried to use these sites and I must say I got a bit frustrated with them. So um, the question I was going to ask is, is, is there an off the shelf one that we did uh, that we could use, like the one that you showed us from these sites? Um, what I ended up doing, had a bit more time in preparation last year, is I ended up um, coding <laughs> my own from from scratch um <laughs> it's a bit of a labor of love um and it was quite quite simple um and not very not very adaptable i'm afraid but if anyone is a you know into coding as well you know if any kids are learning um coding that could be quite a good quite a good approach as well um it was great and i think the concept of kind of puzzles that people solve that fill in in places and leave them other places um even if you don't build a kind of coded thing you can even do it on a google form with five questions and a password at the end um but i will share the link to the pre-made one and to the thankfully the online escape room makers have got better since last year so um that is useful and then um i'm going to show you some ideas that you can like fully lift and then we'll leave time for some kind of questions but here are some principles that i think have come out of the last year of being online and of kind of doing this hybrid like in person online and we got out of the kind of seder experience last year which is firstly it's okay to keep it short it doesn't need to be um 10 hours on on zoom it doesn't need to be six hours or four hours or however long kind of a long family seder can be it can be as long as it takes to create a meaningful experience and not so long that people get bored. Because unlike when you're bored, um, kind of in a room where you like start messing around and like throw wine at someone and all the other things that people do at Seder when they're slightly bored that involve creating memories. Being a bit bored and distracted on Zoom kind of just make, pulls everyone else down a bit. So it's okay to be short and sweet, take a break to eat and come back, all those kind of things, those are all okay things to do and sometimes better things to do than trying to do everything. Um, Sarita asked me at the beginning, which bits of the Seder do you have to do? And it's a really, really good question. And the answer is the plates, the plate and like the cups and the blessings and the candles um, and like telling the story in some way. But as some of you may know, the Haggadah actually never tells the Passover story. And um, so, there isn't such a sense of like you have to do it. I think there are probably for each community or each group that meets for Seder, things that if you don't do them, it doesn't feel like Passover. And for every group of people, that's going to be different. For some people, it'll be Dayenu, Manish Tana, and eating Haraset. For other people, it's going to be all the songs at the end. And both of those are okay. Um, but if you start with thinking about how do you make those that the everything and then leave the other stuff to the side, you're more likely to kind of create a more kind of compelling experience. Make it interactive. Make sure that people can't just be passive um, feel disengaged. It's rubbish to come to something and then never feel seen. Um, embrace the mess of it. It's OK. Like Seda can be very serious and it's, it's really good for it to be serious because it is full of pretty serious themes. Um, and parts of the Haggadah can be kind of sad and moving and can be an amazing time to use stories and all these things. And it's okay that if this year the world is very heavy, we've been through an awful lot, people are really tired and it's okay this year if Seder is a bit lighter. Um, 
people are very conscious of the issues in the world and maybe Seda can be a place where people feel a bit uplifted and uh, feel part of something and have a bit of fun and ask questions and play and that's that's also important and it's not neglecting the message of Passover um, to decide that this year your Seder's priority is fun, hope, community, um, it's okay. Um, I am going to um, show you and walk you through um, what with a kind of view so that I hope there's some ideas in here and I hope that you as I do this will share your ideas. I'm going to share with you what we did last year at Passover um, and uh, partly because it's a bit unorthodox and I hope it's accessible and I hope that from this um, you start to think well oh I could do that instead um, so yeah this is uh, what we did for Seder last year um, this is have I got juice for you it was a, a Seder quiz night the whole Haggadah in a in a game show so we did have some um some content but it was kept light um what a stupid question um and it was done in such a way it was done as a powerpoint so that everybody at Seder could read and we went down the path of spentless alphabetically we did some blessings but then we kind of got a bit creative so we chose four themes for four cups um the Haggadah the cups in the Haggadah symbolize four promises that God made um, to the Israelites in the Haggadah but they can symbolize different different things and you could pick four things that are really valuable for you that each blessing represents um, obviously washing hands was the theme of the day so we ritually washed our hands um, and we ate green vegetables and matzah we did all the kind of things then we got creative so this is um, something that came from Haggadot.com it's a Magid telling a story in emoji. Now you can do this in lots of different ways. Um, I saw that Ben posted in the chat, he used the Brick Testament. There's a brilliant um, Mad Libs version of, um, of the Exodus story that you can find if you just search Haggadah Mad Libs on Google. And what it gives you is, um, it'll say like the Israelites were, and it leaves a space and it says difficult job underneath it in Egypt there was a ruler pharaoh who was the brackets important person and you put it up on screen you give people five minutes to write their words on a piece of paper and then you invite them to unmute and you discover that uh, the Israelites were um, mothers who always had to unload the dishwasher in Egypt and pharaoh was the health secretary etc and uh, people will come up with ridiculous and silly interpretations and it will give you a way of telling the story that's a bit different. It might be that you uh, play um, what's called just a minute with Magid. So you ask people to tell the Passover story. They have to unmute and they have to do um, a minute, no hesitation, repetition or deviation. And if they miss out, then you go to the next person. So you can think about the whole Magid section as an opportunity for play and storytelling. Within Magid, you also you have the story of the four sons. So we decided this was going to be, uh, sorry, you have the four questions first. And we decided that this was going to be a quiz round. Um, some of you will know the round of mock the week. If this is the answer, what is the question? So we decided we would do four. If this is the answer, what is the question? Um, so we had, uh, some of you will recognize these. Uh, we had six, and the premise of this is that um, it's wrong answers only. Um, so yeah, you can guess what, um, what was happening at the time. Now, this is something that anyone can lift, but it just makes it a bit more playful. So by the time we got to Manish Tana, I think everybody was having a little bit more fun because we played a game and it's okay to play a game. Um, so there's something you can lift. You also have the four sons. So we played a game of odd sun out. We showed four sons. And uh, the, the task was to guess uh, who is the odd son out. Just so uh, this, I don't know if anyone knows the answer to this one. Um, but uh, one of Rain, Wayne Rooney's son's name does not begin with a K. Um, anyway, so there's lots of those. And you're welcome to lift any of these. These are all uh, 
footballers whose fathers were were famous footballers except for one of them who's got a cousin and that's my dad and his brothers and you don't need to see that one um so um dayenu you uh if you went to kenta zoe session you'll know this already the dayenu version in the reform hagada is just different to any other version out there and um, it is worth practicing it it's also a lot of fun to try and do it on the spot um, but what you can't do on Zoom is everyone to sing unmuted at, at one time. So you could pass the verses around. You could also play a game um, of giving people examples, uh, asking people to come up with examples of things that other people have done that could just never be enough. So uh, uh, depending on the dynamic around your Seder table, you can play around with this. Um, Dayenu is an amazing moment to think about gratitude. Right? It's always, it would have been enough. It would have been enough. And the Haggadah says at every stage, even though we know, of course, it wouldn't have been enough. Right? It wouldn't have been enough. It wouldn't have got us out of Egypt. We are still told to be grateful. So you could use Dayenu as a moment to reflect on the things that you are grateful for. And if you're going up and down from fun to serious, fun to serious, you're much more likely to have people with you. Um, plagues i'm going to talk about specifically because plagues are difficult in the middle of a pandemic um there are some really good clips on hugger.com and i'll also share this with you um but one of the things that's distinctive about biblical plagues is plagues in the bible are divine punishment and they are sent as kind of a retribution from god and theologically it's really important to not make the connection between the pandemic and the situation we're in right now and the plagues as punishments from God, because they're not the same thing. Um, we're not living through a plague of the kind of divine kind. And so I think it's, it's okay to say that. It's okay to steer people a little bit at this moment. You might decide that actually this is a really good opportunity to say, well, the plagues were basically things that disrupted the lives of the Egyptians. And so in this moment, we might reflect on the things that disrupt our lives, that might cause threat to our lives. Um, there are also some really, really good um, resources out there about um, whether you should play with the plagues, whether, um, whether the plagues are a toy, whether it's kind of a bit insensitive, etc. And that's a good conversation to have as a, as a, around the table. Like, can we make the plagues fun? Are, is, are some things off limits? Um, are we allowed to kind of play and be happy about the plagues because the Egyptians were cruel? And those are all kinds of things that you can talk about. Um, and there's some really great resources. Midrash Manicures does a very good one every year. It's on the Hagadok.com website of the 10 modern plagues. And uh, her name's Rabbi Yael Buchler, and she um, paints her 10 nails every year to be the um, kind of 10 plagues. This is another activity which I really quite like, which is the Egyptians basically, every time they um, got a new plague, it's because they kept making up excuses and refusing to change their behavior. And um, it gives us a chance to ask questions, like could we be making those same mistakes? Like are there things we need to be doing to change our own, um, our own behavior? Um, you can make it light, you can make it heavy. We then have kind of, I'm just, I don't think any of this is interesting or creative. Um, we have this moment in the Seder where we go out onto our front doorsteps. This is something we've done all year. Um, how has it changed this year? We do a lot of standing on our doorsteps, but in the Haggadah, we're told to pour out our wrath onto the nations. It's a really difficult passage. And in the progressive Haggadot, there are often interpretive passages that say, pour out your love instead. So it might be a moment to kind of have a, a think, you know, what, what have we been doing with our doorsteps all year? And uh, do we want to think about that, that moment on the doorstep differently this year? Um, has it changed forever for us? Um, here's a different Afi Komen idea. Um, Take an image, hide letters inside it. I um, 
created a, a tiny URL, which is a URL shortener, and I hid the end of the URL. When people found the letters, they could complete the puzzle and find the afikoman online. So um, I don't know if you can see, you might need to put your head quite close to your screen, but we sent this out via um, WhatsApp to everyone at Seda where they could zoom in and they had to find the letters hidden inside Boris, unscramble the word, add it to the tinyurl.com, and then it took them to a website where the afikoman was hiding. So um, this was inspired by something that a member at Jackson's Row did, which was hiding things in pictures. You could hide things in family photos. You could, um, you could get really creative. You could send everyone a word and uh, they have to each look in their own place and find the connection between the words. You could get really playful, but this is a different way to do afikoman. And then I think that was pretty much the end of our a, a Haggadah we can use to think through um, creative ideas for Seda. So we have, right on time, we have 15 minutes. And um, what I wanted to do is just leave a bit of space in that time for people to put their hands up, I think it's probably easier, and say, here's a great idea that I have, and I'm going to gift it to everyone else. Or here's a problem that I have, and I can't think through it. Can this group help me think through it? Um, or to say, Thanks, that's great. I got what I needed. Um, that's also fine. Um, but I'm wondering if anyone has any ideas or questions that they're bringing with them. And um, I can't see you all, so you might need to raise your hand digitally if you have a question. Great. Um, stun silence is also good. Um, so, what I'm going to do instead is, oh, David has a question. Go for it, David. Well, just a crazy idea that came for the Afikoman. Great. Which was, um, I sort of got vaguely via sort of something else I saw, which was what are the qualities of, of, of the Afikoman? It's got a hole. It's got holes. It's flat. It's broken. Um, and it's cut in half. So go and find an object that's got a hole. Go and find something that's flat. Go and find something cut in half as quick as you can and bring it to the camera and see who's first. So it's the qualities of the Afikoman, really. <laughs> oh, I love that. Maybe you could do that for all of them, actually. Um, and another thing that I saw someone do that I think is similar to that is to say to people in advance, um, invite everyone to bring something that they would add to the Seder plate that has, that has resonance for them this year, rather than people worrying about getting the right objects for their Seder plate because they can be hard to get and we don't want to encourage people to go to lots of different shops etc you can ask people instead to bring something that symbolizes freedom or reflects the theme of one of the objects on the Seder plate and you can use a virtual Seder plate and I will share a link to one in the chat um, just so you know what you're going to get by email afterwards we're going to get the presentation that I've used with lots of stuff on it plus some extra links. One of them is this, um, the first link of the two I just put in the chat, which is from the American Reform Movement that talks you through all the stages of the Seder with an activity or two suggestion for each one. They've also just put together a series of videos um, which you can go online and watch. I'm also going to put in the chat and again link it to you. Something that we did last year at FRS was to record uh just kidding I don't know what the link is um when I find it I'll send it out via email then maybe um we recorded the second half of the Seder with all the music so if you love music at Seder but you're hosting and you don't really feel like a singer you can share videos of the music and invite everyone to sing along so we'll make sure you have that you can see some other questions Kay has said something about death of the firstborn I want to just say something about that because I think it's probably useful um especially given that there's so much death around at the moment. Um, one of the, um, actually some people who are in this conversation are here. We've been having a conversation at synagogue about um, how we do death of the firstborn when there's children around the table. And um, the essence of the plague of the death of the firstborn is that the plagues became increasingly personal. That um, the plagues start off very kind of collective and at the end it really becomes about Pharaoh. And the death of the firstborn is the thing that kind of could hurt Pharaoh the most. And 
all of the plagues are kind of metaphors. Like we don't have really any evidence that kind of the plagues happened, but what we can see them as, as um, basically the imagination of the Israelites who were increasingly upset and trying to think of ways to hurt Pharaoh. Um, and it's something that we can think about when people are really hurt, they can be really hurtful. And so the uh, imagining the death of the firstborn is the most horrible thing you can imagine. And so we can think about it as um, it's not literal, it's not historical. It's about causing real pain. And um, you can, if you've got younger people around the table, you can say the children got really sick. You don't need to say that, they, that it was about death of the first one. It's kind of okay if you've got very small children around the table um, to kind of say that the last plague, the oldest children got very sick. Um, it's okay to not kind of scare them. I would say if you have things like 10 plagues finger puppets, put the 10th one away. Don't play with the, the kind of, the dead baby or the tombstone or whatever you get in those horrible packets. Um, it's not, it doesn't teach the right message. It's okay to say the last plague isn't a game. Um, and the last plague is when it went too far. And that's why it was the last plague. All of those can be helpful language for thinking about it. Um, it sucks. It's really hard. Um, it's not, it's not a nice thing. Um, I'm just looking quickly. Um, I like Janet's idea of putting God on trial um for imposing the plagues that's a great idea that could be super interactive um yeah janet you rock um naomi and then hover thanks um, i just wanted to know what you thought about the balance between having visual images on screen and seeing everybody because um i know that both in my community and actually my family there's resistance to having things up that stop them seeing all the faces and i'm wondering how you manage that because you're you're putting up quite a lot of visual material so i encourage people to use what to use zoom's side by side mode feature so i say to people it's really better to be on a computer but um when someone's screen sharing on zoom if you hover your mouse over the green thing that comes at the top of the screen that says so and so is sharing screen it there's a little arrow and it gives you the option to choose view as and you can choose something called side-by-side -side mode. Oh. It lets you see both gallery view and the slides being shared. It is 100% worth making a screenshot, like doing that yourself, screenshotting each stage and emailing it out to people. 100% worth it. Um, I can't show you now because I can't do it for you. You have to do it yourself, but I can share my screen and let you guys try it. I'm happy to do that. Um, let me do that quickly. Um, you can just talk us through it whilst we can do that. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Okay, mm -hmm. you should be you should be seeing my screen share now. Mm -hmm. So if you hover over the green thing at the top, it will give you the option to choose view as. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mine doesn't. Um, not everyone's mm -hmm. does. Especially, are you on a tablet by any chance? I'm on a. I'm on a uh, laptop and I've got the latest version of uh, Zoom on as well. So um, it might be that you already have it set up and you just need to use it. So if you look at the top of the um, panel, um, it's top right, just like Mish said, if it's already enabled, you just need to go up to the top right of the, of the screen and it says view. And then on, the little zoom, on the little Zoom uh, view square, it's there with the... Yeah. It doesn't work on an iPad. Um, and also as Ben said, if you have seconds, if you have two screens, you just need to enable second screen. But um, if you choose view as, if you have the view option enabled already, then you can just choose side by side and then you pick gallery view. Um, but that is um, the easiest way to not compromise. You can also have one person logged in um, and um, their job only is to share the slides and the person leading the slide is on a different device and you can multiple spotlight. So the slides are spotlighted, but small. That's much harder for people to see. It's better to give people the ability to skill them up, give them the ability to do side by side. Um, not everyone's gonna be able to do it and that's okay. But I think that's the easiest way to manage the compromise. People, people have really struggled with having the flip books open and zoom open at the same time it doesn't mm -hmm. seem to work for them and i wouldn't encourage it. it it just it's confusing and not nice 
Um, I would instead say to them, have a second device if you need to, like have it on your phone. Um, not everyone has multiple devices, but if they do, it's preferable. Um, have a, oh, wait, no, me, you done? Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Alva, it's so nice to see you. Hi, oh, lovely to see you too, Deborah. So with great um, joy, really, I'm now with my little family and there's a three-year-old and a new baby. Last year, we just had the three-year-old and the parents and me. And I discovered something absolutely wonderful, which is Debbie Friedman's Seder Table song. And because the three-year-old is heavily into movement and dashing about, we just used that to start our thinking about what we're going to be doing. And when he was very tired at the end, we all got up and danced around with him and we thought, Actually, that was a really good idea. So it's on a on a CD um, of Debbie Friedman's, which is with the different festivals, but especially written for children. So that was my little idea to share. And thank you for all your wonderful ideas, Deborah. Thank you. I love your idea, Hava. I also think it's okay to build bedtime into your Seder, um, especially if you're like putting together a PowerPoint or an order of the evening. It's okay to put bedtime in. So to say like, the beginning is going to be kids time then you're going to pause and do bedtime and then carry on um it, it can be quite nice actually especially and it, that doesn't need to be for small children it can be for every age you you know that it can be a point where you say right now you're going to go watch prince of egypt you don't need to sit at the table anymore um and that is totally great and fine and the benefit of being at home potentially um thank you everybody who's helping people in the chat um, figure out side by side mode you can also just google it and um, I love it so Leia said they're going to have Havdalah in Seder as uh, that her son loves Havdalah and um, that is awesome that's great um, your son is awesome too I was going to say you can also play a little bit so you know if you have someone you know if you have toys if you've got small kids and small children in the family make the screen interesting for them by bringing objects into the screen that make it interesting um, if you have a grandparent telling a bit of a story, like do it with toys, make it fun, make it silly. Um, puppets are great. Um, yeah, like there's a gajillion ideas for everything, but um, my mate Koff and I, um, we do a lot of stuff on Zoom. We fit really nicely in the box. And if you happen to have a puppet at home, yeah, they really like Seda. Um, and Stella said last year, all the adults returned after bedtime and chatted without the young ones. That's a really nice thing to do, to have that final cup, that final l'chaim, that kind of like next year. It might be quite important for your family to um, have that moment. And um, Ben, I all, the, the, the actual Junior is, is a, she took it offline so that her community wouldn't see it before Seder. So I've got the cached version, which is why I'm going to send you the link or you won't find it. Um, it's hidden like the Afi Um, We have two minutes left. So what I'm going to um, say is that um, you're welcome to email me. I'm going to put it in the chat. Um, I'll be slow before Thursday because we have an RAGM. Um, but um, you are welcome to email me and ask questions. What I'd actually really love if, um, if you do something really cool or really creative, like why not tell us and we'll do like some kind of roundup afterwards um, to share with the movement of what, of what people have done. Um, partly because this, this is like an amazing gift of an opportunity to, to kind of take ownership of our, of our Judaism and our Jewish spaces. And um, I don't think any of us would have asked for this, this moment in time, but given that we have it, we also have the chance to kind of think about how we make it meaningful and how we get what we need from it so start with the why what do you need from Seder this year what do your people need from Seder this year and then do what you can to give yourself what you need um and have fun serious can wait have fun um yeah good night everyone you can hang out and ask questions or you can go and have a mooch on the sofa Thank you. Deborah, do you know, you never cease to amaze me, your creativity. I thought I knew a lot of what you were going to say, but nowhere near, don't even scratch the surface. Absolutely wonderful. Um, I have done my best to um, copy all of the links that have gone into the chat so that when Deborah sends me her presentation, I can try and include links with 
um, with a presentation. Don't tell me when I've missed one because I've done my best. But thank you. It's been brilliant. Absolutely loved it. Um, I also did. I also include links to the Haggadahs that are online. We've got the flipping book and we've got single page scrolling to make it easier this year, um, as well as some videos on there from our rabbis singing, rabbis and cantors singing various songs from the Seder so that if you need a bit of extra support or a bit of difference in your evening, some different voices, you can use those as well and they're all downloadable. Um, thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. And um, it's a bit too early to say Hachsameya, really. Almost almost nearly Shabbat. Yes. <laughs>